Whether you're a diehard sports fan, a hopeless romantic, or a comedy aficionado, the Xfinity 10G network was made for streaming it all. Worry less about buffering when streaming your favorite shows, movies, or live sports and enjoy a better way to watch. Xfinity gives you a reliable connection for streaming plus all the entertainment you love all in one place. Fear not, because now you can finally sit back, relax, and stream your favorite entertainment and sports like never before with the Xfinity 10G network. Hello and welcome to episode 61 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Sunday, November 11th. Duke is 2-0 and on the basketball season, and they have now four wins in football. Uh, we'll get to all that shortly here, but first I will introduce uh, myself and the other co-hosts as usual. I am Sam Klein calling from Denver, Colorado. I am joined by Jason Evans in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, and I am so, so, so excited that we have college basketball has begun again. Some great games to start the weekend, and uh, we're really eager for, for Duke. Uh, we've played a couple, um, but we got some big ones coming up. Absolutely. And in Washington, D.C., Donald won. And, and as, as happy as I am that basketball is back, I am even more happy that the Victory Bell is back on campus. All yes. Right. We will. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> no, I was going to say, um, do, do either of you know, uh, I, 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 usually the Victory Bell gets painted dark, dark blue whenever we win, and then they put that GAC color, color crazy color on it when they win, um, have we defeated, because it's a brand new victory bell. Um, it, you know, it was like they painted it uh, nice and neat and everything, which, no, this is not right. It should be, it should be controlled by the team that wins, and we have won. So uh, have you guys heard, have we destroyed it yet? Uh, looking at the game on Saturday, they brought it, in, brought it into a uh, uh, ring at halftime, and it still had the half and half painting on it. I think they're actually going to paint it all blue. I think that was the initial thing, but it wasn't the spray paint job um, that we've seen in years past. Um, you can thank UNC causing $27,000 worth of damage at uh, Wallace <laughs> Wade uh, for that decision. But uh, I think it is going to get a full, uh, cool Duke blue paint job and not that stupid blue. I, I've, I've yeah. distracted us from, from college basketball. I, I <laughs> sure, so we'll, we'll, we'll get around to, uh, to Duke football here at the end. But first, um, we're going to go over the two games that Duke played this weekend against Marist and Grand Canyon. We will talk about the uh, game upcoming this week against Kansas. Uh, we have a special uh, segment this week. We did a, Jason conducted an interview a few days ago with Ryan Kelly that we'll play and react to. Um, we have to talk about Duke getting a, uh, a five-star commitment in basketball and Gary Trent. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go over football and, and we'll wrap up with our parting shots and our players of the week. Sound good to you guys? It is a full podcast. Yeah, let's got, do it. We, we got a lot to do today. Okay, so let's start Friday night. Duke, um, Duke opened the season in basketball against uh, the Marist Red Foxes. Duke ran away 94 to 49. It wasn't a particularly close game uh, for at any point. I think that Duke jumped out to an 11 or 12 point lead before Marist scored a point. And then on Saturday, um, Duke took out a Grand Canyon team that I think when we previewed, we said that they had had a pretty successful season last year. They had a lot of guys coming back. Um, Dan Marley's squad, we know was going to be was know was going to be good. Although we expected Duke to win, and they did. Although uh, it took them a little longer to 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 wrest control away from the Antelopes. It was ninety six to sixty one. So I'll start with Donald. What were your impressions from the weekend um, from these first two games uh, for Duke? I have a few. Uh, the first one I have is I, I know last podcast we talked about predictions, and I had the bold prediction of 10 100-point uh, games for uh, our Blue Devils. So while I'm 0 for 2 so far to start the season, I am 2 for 2 in games that I predicted we'd get 100 points that they scored 90-something. So I don't know if that's, a, a, if that's something I can get a Happy Meal for uh, or something like that. But uh, no, at least, no at least you do not. No Happy you Meals? Not okay. Happy meal. <laughs> well, I had two this week, so it had to be triple digits, so and and you ca they came up short. I, I they came up just short. Yeah, um, I, I'm like I'm liking my seven. My yeah. prediction for seven is looking good right we now. Still got we still got hopefully 38 more games, so uh, I, there's still a chance. But uh, anyway, back to the game. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to highlight. One, um, I think the defense in both games was great for the majority of both games. Uh, we had 15 combined blocks and 25 combined steals. Um, I think 
Matt Jones was great uh, on, on the defensive end, uh, as was interior. I think one of the surprises I saw um, uh, through a lot of the games, uh, both on Friday and Saturday, Chase Jeter uh, showed himself well on the defensive end, I thought. Um, and as well, you know, as did uh, Emil Jefferson, who has been uh, the man uh, so far. Uh, Vrankovic also had 10 boards on Friday. Um, there's an, I mean, there's a lot that you can take away from these games. There's a lot you, you really can't because of the uh, level of competition. But I think the fact that we are rebounding very well on Friday, that's a very good sign. That's what we want to see, um, especially if we're going up against Kansas, who we'll talk about in a little while, um, is a good rebounding team and, and shows well on the inside. I like the fact that we had great interior defense. Um, our perimeter defense, I thought, was great, led to a lot of steals. Um, it, it also kind of caused a little bit of a, a erraticness at times, especially during the Grand Canyon game. But I think that also has something to do with the fact that it's the first couple games. It's, you know, that game was less than 24 hours at the start of the first game. Um, so I think that may have something to do with it as well. Um, drawbacks that I had, the one that I saw that was kind of weird, um, and it's something that um, we had talked about a couple podcasts ago with Mark Newton and his uh, uh, introduction of the defenses that they were learning in practice. A couple times during the game against Grand Canyon and against Marist, we showed a 2-3 zone. And at times when we did that, we had trouble with rebounding on missed jumpers. And, the, and where I saw the trouble was guys, normally in, in a man-to-man -man defense, you have a man. So when the ball goes up in the air, you know where your guy is. You can turn and box him out and get the positioning that you need to get the rebound. I think on, when we did man-to-man -man defense, we were very good at jumping up, grabbing rebounds, and getting out in transition. When we have a 2-3 zone, that body that you're looking for may not necessarily be in your area. So I think what they were having trouble with is picking up the, cr the guys that were crashing on the uh, opposing team uh, and finding those bodies to box out. So, and that led to a few offensive um, second chance and third chances for uh, Marist and Grand Canyon. So those are things you need to work on, especially uh, against those uh, teams that will face down the road that have great interior um, uh, offensive play. And I think that's something that will probably be a key of emphasis uh, going into this week where we have three games coming up. But uh, those are the things, things I wanted to uh, uh, shout out initially. And Jason, what did you think? Well, let me take each game one at a time. I got a few comments on each one of them because I got to see them both, of course. Um, uh, for the Maris game, <clears throat> uh, size was a huge factor. You already brought this up. We had 56 rebounds in that game, 16 of them offensive. That is just a lot of rebounds. And poor Maris, I mean, they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. They were three of 25 on threes. Um, and Duke blocked seven shots. I thought Maris seemed intimidated by being in Cameron with that crowd. They were intimidated by playing against Duke and all these, you know, all Americans and the such. Uh, and they couldn't really compete uh, from that standpoint. Uh, I thought Chase Jeter, you, you mentioned him, Donald. You're absolutely right. He looks like a different guy from his freshman year. He's still really limited offensively. He doesn't have a lot of moves. He's not a guy who's going to score a lot for us, but he was stronger with the ball, and he did a really nice job on rebounding, and I thought he had good defense. I'm going to get to him against Grand Canyon in a second because I thought he was especially important against Grand Canyon. Um, Frank Jackson was so strong and athletic with the ball against Marist and against Grand Canyon. I mean, this is a guy, he is just a physical player when he has the ball in his hands. He's a hey, good shooter dude, from the outside. That, that dude, Frank Jackson, was all over my uh, my, my predictions list. So um, keep, yeah. keep up the good work, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> sorry, keep, keep going, Jason. I just wanted to make sure we were, we were referencing that. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> um, for the moment, he looks like he's going to get major, major, major minutes for Duke. Um, and, and, and he was very impressive, I thought, in both games. Didn't show any freshman jitters uh, a, a, at all. Um, I really love the way in, <clears throat> in both games that Duke attacked the basket and drew fouls. We shot 37 foul shots against Maris. We shot 31 against Grand Canyon. When you're getting over 30 foul shots, um, it means that you're really going hard at the basket and, uh, and the defense can't stop you. So let me talk about Grand Canyon for a second. Um, uh, they, uh, you know, they did a little bit better on the boards against us. Um, uh, we only won the rebounding battle 39 to 31. And when we start, talk about Kansas in a minute, I'm going to disagree with Donald. Donald said Kansas is a good rebounding team and good inside. I actually think rebounding is a place where Duke is going to have to be successful against Kansas um, uh, if we really hope to, uh, you know, to, to beat them because they're, they're so good on the perimeter. Um, I want to give shout out in the Grand Canyon game 
to Uncle Matty, to Matt Jones, who played some really great D on Joshua Braun. Now, if you don't know a lot about Grand Canyon and you watch the game, you'd be like, wait, who is Joshua Braun? Um, Because he only scored five points against Duke and he didn't do very much at all against us. Well, Joshua Braun is the preseason whack player of the year. He averaged 16 and a half points a game last year. Um, This is a guy who... Grand Canyon probably was expecting to get, you know, 18 to 20 points a game this season. He did nothing against Duke. It was mostly Matt Jones that was guarding him. And Joshua Braun was completely frustrated. And, uh, you know, I think Maris stayed close. I'm sorry, Grand Canyon stayed close early. But when they faded, it was because they kept on hoping that he was going to pick them up. And he couldn't because Matt Jones was suffocating him the whole time. I was concerned about one thing. Their point guard, the Grand Canyon point guard, Shaq Carr, was getting to the rim really easily early in the first half. He was, uh, he was both getting there for layups for himself or to feed other players when the defense came and helped out. But I thought that Emil Jefferson and Chase Jeter really adjusted nicely to Shaq Carr going to the basket. They blocked some of his shots. They altered a few others. They shut him down. And he, he did nothing late. And once he couldn't do anything, Grand Canyon was absolutely toast on offense. I want to give you guys a couple runs that Duke went on. Because I think there was about a seven or eight minute span that was about as good as you're going to see this Duke team play. The score was 30 to 26. Duke was only leading by four with about four and a half minutes left in the first half. We then closed out the first half on a 16 to three run. We then started the second half on a 14 to two run. In a span, like I said, of about seven or eight minutes, we outscored them 30 to five. And Grand Canyon is not a bad team. They're not a great team. But they're a pretty good team. They're probably the best team in the WAC, or they're really close to being the best team in the WAC. And we crushed them over seven or eight minutes, 30 to five. Last thing I wanted to mention, and then Sam, I'll let you chat a little bit about this. Grayson Allen had one move fairly early in the second half that I just, I, I was cracking up. It was hysterical. So Grayson has as good a first step as I've seen in quite a while. He, he jabbed with that first step, and the guy who was defending him um, was sure Grayson was going to drive. So the guy started to back up. So Grayson stepped back a little bit. And the defenders thought, oh, he's going to take a three. So the defender starts to go forward. So now half his body's going forward and half his body's going backwards. And the guy like spun in a full circle. And you almost saw Grayson laugh as he put the ball on the floor and easily went in for a slam dunk. It was, uh, to me, it was hysterical. This poor guy, he knew, oh my God, how am I going to possibly stop this Grayson Allen guy? And the answer was, I'm going to turn a circle, do a pirouette, and pray. And that didn't work. That's an and one move. That's a, yeah. that was, I, saw that, I saw that during the game, and I was like, that is one of those things where in, in and one mixtape games, if you did that and you broke somebody down to that point, you, they would throw the ball in the stands and just start laughing at the dude. And he just kind of laughed at him on the way to, to finishing off with, a, with an easy dunk because nobody else was, once they saw that, the entire rest of the team almost parted to see. It was like, look, he's earned that, those two points. Yeah, I, I swear, half this guy's body was going one direction and half was going the other. It was awesome. Grayson finished. Uh, his stat line was so great. 25 points, 10 rebounds, 4 assists, 3 steals, uh, a really complete game against not a cupcake opponent. Not a, not a great opponent, but not a cupcake. Sam, what you got? I was going to say, there's a reason that Grayson Allen is the preseason player of the year, both in the ACC and nationally, right? Yes, I mean, yes. We, we know that he can do this, and... and Sadly for dudes who are going to Grand Canyon for basketball, um, they're probably not going to be able to stop him one-on-one when, uh, when he's just staring him down and, and dribbling. So that's, that's the reality uh, of trying to guard Grayson Allen. I will echo a couple of the comments that you guys made. The first being that the individual defensive effort was really nice. The team defense is still getting there, and we especially saw that against Grand Canyon. Obviously, um, Grand Canyon had, had a little bit more athleticism and, and a little bit more uh, skill than we saw from Maris. I, I would liken Grand Canyon to like a like a lower tier ACC team. You know, like whoever ends up being like 14th or 15th in the conference is probably similar to Grand Canyon. They have the athleticism to hang around with this team, but ultimately they're they're just not going to be able to sustain it for 40 minutes. And as you pointed out, Jason, that that run at the end of the first half and then early in the second half is really what what brought the margin large enough that and Duke didn't make the margin much bigger after that. It basically just hang hung on um, for the rest of the game. But I will say that the, so the individual defensive effort was really strong. I loved, uh, I like watching Frank Jackson play defense. I loved Matt Jones. Um, uh, Neil Jefferson obviously has come back and, and appears to be in, in, you know, with his full ability back uh, on both ends of the ball, on both ends of the court. 
So that that was really good to see. I will ask you guys, um, I there's one prediction I wish we would have made uh, that we all would have gotten wrong. And that prediction was who's going to be the first man off the bench for Duke this season. And the answer was, who remembers? Antonio was Frankovich. It? Yeah, it was Frankovich, <laughs> right. It was Frank, yeah. He came off the bench first in the Marist game, not Frank Jackson. And then I think Delorier came after him. And obviously the situation is a little different than what it would be ideally since Tatum and Giles and Bolden are out. But uh, it was funny that Frank Jackson, I think, according to the substitution patterns, is now the eighth man in the current team. Um, but I think that's just because, you know, Jones and, and Kennard were both hot to start the to start the Marist game. So they, they weren't going to get pulled um, for a freshman well, at that well, point. Well, uh, you, you bring it up. Um, I think that it's very likely that we're going to only play, for the most part, six guys against Kansas. Um, I mean, I, I hate to, are, are we ready to jump ahead to Kansas? <laughs> I, I, well, I, I was just going to add that um, there are a lot of inflated numbers from this weekend. Um, I see that Vrankovic had 10 rebounds against Maris. I know that um, Grayson Allen had 10 rebounds against Grand Canyon. Um, don't expect, <laughs> that was just, just, just a blanket warning, that not to expect things like that to continue. I will say that the, um, the race for scoring the most points on this team um, throughout the season is going to be very interesting because we know that Luke Kennard can shoot it. We know that Grayson Allen can score in a lot of ways. And we've seen Frank Jackson now in two games um, be able to score in a few different ways, including being able to hit that three. Um, so it's going to be a fun competition between a few guys as to who scores the most points. I, I, I don't think we have much more to say about Marist and Grand Canyon. Um, although I did it, I will, yeah, although, I, I would conclude, uh, I would conclude just by saying that I enjoyed the, um, the footage of, uh, Dan Marley ripping off his shirt to reveal his, uh, painted, uh, Grand Canyon logo on his chest during their midnight madness. That was, uh, that was something else. Uh, did you have something you wanted, wanted to finish with Jason? Uh, well, uh, so the only thing I wanted to say was, um, yeah, it's nice that Frank Jackson got those points against these teams, and, and he's going to be a scorer for us. But the notion that the, um, that the, the season-long scoring title, that he's competitive in that, I think uh, is mis- misguided. Um, I, I, do, I don't think Frank Jackson is going to keep up with Grayson Allen or Luke Kennard um, from a scoring standpoint this season. Grayson, Grayson Allen's going to average 18-plus yeah. points a game. So, no, yeah, I, I, yeah. I agree with that. But, but hey, you never know. You never know. With that, we turn to this week. Uh, the coming week, Duke on Tuesday night is going to be playing uh, the Kansas Jayhawks in the, I don't know how many years now we've had the Champions Classic, but it's the annual, become the annual tradition that Duke plays one of Kentucky, Kansas, or Michigan State early in the season. This year, the competition is at Madison Square Garden. I know I've heard from a few friends on the East Coast who are going to be in attendance. Kansas uh, lost their opening game against a, the 11th-ranked Indiana Hoosiers. Uh, they were playing in Hawaii in the Armed Forces Classic, which was actually looked really cool on TV. Um, it was a, and it was a tight game. They, uh, they ended up going into overtime, and Kansas only lost by four. But the Jayhawks did come into the season ranked number three in the nation. Uh, so, Jason, I'll throw it to you. Give me some keys to the game for Duke against uh, this, this very strong Kansas squad. Um, so Frank Mason the third, Frank Mason the third may be the toughest and strongest five eleven guy in the NCAA. He is uh, he, he's one of the guards for Kansas, and this Kansas team to me is incredibly perimeter oriented. Um, uh, Frank Mason had a huge game um, against Indiana in that game. They lost one hundred three to ninety nine. Um, uh, he, he scored thirty points. Um, he was driving the ball hard to the goal. He shot 15 free throws all by himself. That's a lot of free throws for one guy to be, to be taking. Um, and uh, Devontae Graham, his backcourt running mate, had nine free throws and 16 points. Those two guys led, led Kansas in scoring against Indiana. No one should be surprised at that. Those two guys, uh, coming into the season, many people said that Kansas had the best backcourt in the nation um, because of Mason and Graham. Uh, and to a lesser extent, Josh Jackson, the ridiculous stud freshman that they have, who, who's uh, you know wing small forward type, um, plays uh, well, well, well above the rim. Um, but uh, I, I am really worried um, about our ability to stop Mason and Graham from getting to the rim. Uh, we talked about how uh, Shaq Carr of Grand Canyon was able to get to the rim against Duke, um, and uh, you know we've talked a little bit about Frank Jackson. Frank Jackson, I think. 
um, ha- was struggling defensively in our first two games. The competition is about to step well, well, well up. Huge, huge step up for him from a defensive standpoint, and I'm not sure who he's going to be able to guard. Um, I don't know that Duke has anyone who is a really quick perimeter defender who can stay in front of Frank Mason. I'm, I'm guessing it'll be Matt Jones who gets the assignment. Matt Jones always gets the toughest defensive assignment. Um, but, you know, it, it is not going, to be, not going to be easy against them at all. Um, Kansas, the place where I think we can have them, the place where I, where I think they may struggle some, and I wish, I wish Duke had our, our three best, well, I, don't, I say our three best big men, but our, our three freshman big men. Um, none of whom will be available for this game, I don't think. But but Kansas, to me, is not a great rebounding team. They don't have good depth on the front line. Um, Layden Lucas is their best guy on the boards, and, and he's really their only true sort of post player, guy who rebounds really well. They're going to play a lot of um, four guards around Layden Lucas. Um, Iowa, I'm sorry, not Iowa, Indiana. Uh, Indiana pummeled them on the boards, 50 to 39. Indiana got 18 offensive rebounds. The reason Indiana was in this game was because they could often throw the ball up at the rim and just go grab it. Um, and, and I'm hoping Duke will be able to do a little bit of that. Emil Jefferson is going to be hugely important. Um, getting rebounds out of guys like Matt Jones, Luke Kennard, Chase Jeter, Grayson Allen. It's going to be hugely important. Um, and, uh, you know, Kansas uses their athletic guards to rebound because they don't have forwards and they don't have centers who can do it on their own. Um, our, our guards, our wing players, have got to be mindful of not letting Kansas hit the boards with their guards. And, um, you know, we probably have to shoot a little better than we did. It's going to be a really, really tough game. Last thing I'll say about them, you want to hear an amazing stat? I was reading up a little bit on Kansas. It has been seven years since the Kansas Jayhawks were anything but a number one or number two seed in the NCAA tournament. Seven years, and get this, Bill Self has been there. This is his 14th season, so in the previous 13 years that Bill Self has been at at Kansas, they have never been lower than a number four seed in the NCAA tournament. They are a model of consistency. And and they've never failed to win a share of the Big 12 title. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, they they own the I mean, like they own the Big Twelve in a stupid, ridiculous kind of way. And that's every single season. They've owned the Big Twelve for half my life. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is really impressive. Uh, uh, Donald, I'll I'll send it over to you. Uh, But uh, the point I was making was Kansas is always great. This is a great game to measure yourself, even though Duke's measuring themselves minus three of our best players. Yeah, and and. I'm glad you brought that part up because uh, there was a quote, I guess, after uh, the Grand Canyon game um, that Matt Jones said, um, and they were asking about uh, this Kansas game, uh, despite all the injuries that we have. And he said, we're a team of no excuses. Uh, We feel that Duke wins games like those, and Coach is a great competitor, and we feed off that. Me, Emil, and Grayson have been in plenty of games like that, and we expect to win as well. The reason why that quote is important is because I think the takeaway from these last couple games, um, you heard it a lot if you, if you watch the games from the announcers on the broadcast, is that the team as we have it right now is a good team. But it's not a, the national championship team that people expect us to compete for. Um, well, well wait, wait. To, missing, be, what, to be clear, wait, wait. I, think, I think we're good enough to compete for the national title. I think that when we I get think, these other guys back, we will be prohibitive favorite. But go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. I, w- I was saying that that's what the announcers are saying. Um, that they're that this is a good, not great, not elite team, and I think that is something that really gets at Grayson, Emil, and Matt Jones, especially, and, and not and not just them, but, but the rest of the team. I think they want to come out here against Kansas, and they want to establish the, the the tempo that, and basically make the statement that no matter who is on the court for Duke, we take everyone's best shot, and we're going to dish it right back. And I think those three guys probably saw the heard about oh well this team's good yet but we have to wait for these three freshmen and you know there's part of that upper class that mentality they're like hey look guys we've all won national championships we've all been at this situation before where people say well your best guys are out so you guys clearly aren't good enough and i think they're kind of using this little it's a very small chip but it's a chip nonetheless like it's it's is sometimes you have to take the little things and, and blow that up to say, this is how we're going to prepare for this game to come out and make a statement. And I think all that you said about Kansas is, is, is excellent, but I think you're going to see a fired up Duke team uh, in New York on, on Tuesday as well. We play great there. Um, 
we, you know, and Coach K is a, is, is a master at these games, especially the Champions Classic, where we you know, pretty much over the over the I guess the sixth year of it, um, I think we won four of them. So uh, this is uh, this is something that or, I'm sorry, we won three. We've gone three and two. But I think this is what we want to look for. We want to look for the the tempo. We want to look for the mentality, uh, the, the the defense, and, and I think on Kansas side, like all of that is good, and I think they are a great team. Um, even even though they lost the. Uh, Indiana, who I think Indiana is going to be one of those teams that is going to be talked about later on in the season, not just uh, early in the season as well. But I think the one thing to take away from this is in New York, the whites are on. It's going to be a 10 o'clock start most likely uh, when you talk about the uh, Michigan State-Kentucky game will probably run a little bit over. Um, and so 10 o'clock is a, is a late start for everybody. Who's going to come out quick? Who's going to come out and, and have that that tenacious tempo and, and that, that tenacious defense um, and the momentum going out, out of the, off the bat. And I think that is where the three captains are going to step up and say, we've been in this situation before. We, we know what's, what it takes to play with the best teams in the country. And I, I expect to see those three guys lead this team on Tuesday. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I will note something that Jason had said, which is that um, I'm curious to see the way that Duke defends this Kansas team. Obviously they have, more talent on the perimeter than they do inside. And uh, just looking at the stats, it doesn't seem like Josh Jackson made a huge impact against Indiana. Although the, you know, prognosticators are saying that, uh, that Josh Jackson has a chance to be the number one pick in this draft. If he's not the number one pick, he's maybe going to be two or three. And, and he's a, he's a really talented wing player. If Duke has Jason Tatum back, then Tatum probably draws that, um, draws that assignment, but we're, I, I can't say that we're going to see him on Tuesday night. So it'll be interesting to see the way that they, the way that they stop him in addition to those point guard or to the, to their, to their other guards. Um, and, and outside of that, yeah, I think you guys covered a lot of it that I'm just glad that Duke gets to keep playing in games like this. This Kansas team is, is perhaps as good as any in the country at the moment, uh, even though they lost that game to Indiana, who's also looking like a, like a strong team. So I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing what Duke can throw at them, um, and we'll see if any of the uh, if any of the injured players are able to come back. Because, uh, as Jason noted, getting rebounds against this team is going to be essential, and and getting those getting those putbacks uh, on the offensive end. The uh, the offense, at least in, at the end of the Grand Canyon games, tr- was seemed like they were trying to get the ball inside to the big guys. I think that Cheater got a couple more chances. Um, Delorier got some chances inside Jefferson. So. We'll see if they can. We'll see if they can get the ball inside against this Kansas team. Um, you think that's it, guys, for Kansas? I know that we have a couple games coming up next weekend. Well, I, I was think one say, game. Go ahead, Jason. I was going to say really quick, um, just because you mentioned it there, Sam. Uh, I do think we should very quickly address the fact Coach K was very, very clear after the Marist game, and they. I don't even think the press bothered to ask him about it after Grand Canyon because he was so clear after Marist that he is not bringing Tatum, Giles, or Bolden back early. Um, uh, not to say he doesn't care about winning these early season games, not to say that he doesn't care about beating Kansas and, and Penn State or whoever it is may, we may be playing next weekend, um, who will also be a BCS um, uh, conference, you know, a Power 5 conference team. Um, but he is not going to uh, aggravate injuries or, uh, you know, or, or have kids you know, maybe be playing at 80%. He, they, those guys are not going to come back until they are 100%. And the result of that may be that it's possible we may not see them the entire month of November. But you know what? You know how many national titles have been won in November? Zero. You know how many national titles have been won in December? Zero. Coach K understands that it is about having these guys healthy, ready, and playing their best once we hit maybe January, but February and March. Um, and it may be frustrating for us as Duke fans. God, I am dying to see these guys play, uh, especially Tatum and Giles, who I think are, are incredibly special ball players. I mean, look, the little glimmer we got of Jason Tatum in that first exhibition game, or sorry, in the blue-white game, I was like, oh, man, this guy is, this guy is truly, truly special. Um, and we haven't seen any of Giles yet, but we just got to wait our time. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, it is frustrating. I want I want us to go out there, and I don't want us to lose any games. I think we have a chance to go forty and zero, but um, uh, it's not like we're going into battle with only pea shooters, uh, Grayson and Emil Jefferson and uh, Frank Jackson and Luke Kennard and Matt Jones. I'm 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 pretty comfortable rolling out with those guys. Anyway, I just want yeah, to say that. And I think 
you know, and, and that led to my final question that, that the key is to look for. And, and I think that question is who uh, does Coach K trust in these big games this early season with this lineup that we have? Um, you know, he trusts the, the, the three upperclassmen. He trusts probably Luke Kennard. Um, but, you know, is Frank Jackson in that, in that equation? Is there going to be somebody who normally is on the bench? Is there going to be somebody uh, like Rankovic that he could bring in in big situations and play kind of like Zubik did uh, later on the season in 2010? Um, in that magical run, or, or does he does he go with Javon Delarier? Um, I think those are the questions that we have to see. We know his core, um, and I think when it comes down to crunch time, if there's foul trouble, if there's if there's other uh, people having an off night, uh, I think this is the the game where you kind of see who from this young group uh, that Coach K trusts, so that when he adds these final pieces, uh, when they're 100%, we can we can see what our core is, we can see what our team is. But uh, I, I think that's a it will be an interesting one to see how these players react to being under the lights of the of the mecca that is Madison Square Garden. By the way, I'll, I'll note something about you know as I mentioned about Kansas, they aren't that big. Um, they tend to um, play four you know guard wing types around one big man in Laden Lucas. I won't be at all surprised. As well as I think Chase Jeter has played, um, I won't be even mildly surprised if Duke is mostly going you know four wing type guard type guys around Emil Jefferson um, for much of this game. I, Chase Jeter still starts. Chase Jeter will still play significant, significant minutes. I, I think I think Duke's largely going to only play six guys, but um, I, I think we're going to see a lot a lot of Frank Jackson and and a little less of Chase Jeter in the Kansas game, just the nature of the way Kansas plays. Um, and Coach K sort of likes to do that if he can. He likes playing more perimeter guys. That, that wouldn't surprise me either. Um... Let's move on. Uh, we are talking about current Duke guys. I mentioned at the top of the show that this week Jason had the opportunity to chat with former Duke power forward Ryan Kelly. He's currently playing in the NBA um, for the Atlanta Hawks. So let's uh, let's let's run the tape on that and, and let's listen to Jason's interview with Ryan Kelly. So, Ryan, first of all, congratulations on catching on with the Hawks. I am in Atlanta. I'm a big Hawks fan. Um, I know. Making a NBA team is not easy. Um, what, what's been the biggest adjustment for you from um, college to the NBA? Well, uh, you know, it's a, obviously every level you go up is bigger, faster, stronger. Um, you know, there's great athletes at every position. Um, you have to be able to defend your position and then um, also knock down the three ball. For, for a guy my size, you know, I think that's something I showed I could do at Duke. And, um, you know, I've continued to try and improve on as an NBA three-point shooter. Um, and that's certainly a transition. And, um, you know, in the last couple of years, I was put in a position where I was really um, playing an unnatural spot for me, play, basically playing small forward, um, which I haven't done in my life. Um, <laughs> right. So, so there was a struggle at times the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, I'm really excited to be in Atlanta. I think it's a great fit and, um, you know, somewhere where I can grow and, and be the best player I can be. I, I like the sound of that because, like I said, as a Hawks fan, I want you to be the, uh, you know, a key member for this team. Um, now, you spent a couple years, a few years with the Lakers. Um, didn't win a lot when you guys were there. I don't think you guys ever even won 30 games. Um, you're now in a Hawks team that is winning a lot. I mean, you guys beat the Cavaliers the other day. Congratulations. You're obviously yeah, one of the absolutely. best teams in the Eastern Conference. You obviously won a lot at Duke as well. Do you sense, is there sort of a difference um, in the locker room, in the attitude, in the vibe around the team, um, winning versus losing? I mean, that may be an obvious question, but I'm, uh, it just sort of intrigued me with your, your career. Anytime I, I see a Duke guy that goes to an NBA team that doesn't win as much, I go, ah, oh, I really feel for them. It must be very different. Yeah, it, it's tough, um, you know, personally and, and on a group level. I mean, losing wears on you. And like you said, coming from a winning culture, you know, high school and and, and beyond in college you know it was, it was a you know if you lost one game it felt like it was the end of the world at duke um and then you go to a, a level first of all you know the transition you're, you're going to lose games i mean you know there, there's going to be more losses in a single season just because of the sheer number of games and how you know back to back they are and and every other day um but you don't expect to lose you know significantly more than you're going to win 
And, um, you know, it wears on you. It's tough. Um, it's a long season, and, and when you're losing, you can get into ruts where it's hard to break. Um, and I think we certainly had that uh, a number of times in, in my three years with the Lakers. And um, to, to say I was frustrated by that, and, and we were all frustrated by that, is, is an understatement. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm super excited to be in a place where, you know, winning's expected on a nightly basis. And, and, you know, that standard is, you know, set and everybody wants to live up to it. And, and that's certainly how it was at Duke. And, um, you know, this, this organization is, is run in that similar manner. Uh, are there things that you learned at Duke that you think have given you a leg up on the competition in the NBA? Um, well, I, I think Coach K – I saw how hard he worked for every single game. And, you know, for a guy having done it for so long, for so many years, to still put in the time, watch the film, study the game, um, you know, it, it really made me step back and go, wow, he, after winning a thousand games, is still willing to put in that level of effort for everyone. One, because he loves it, but two, because of his competitive spirit, because. You know, he wants to keep going. Um, and for me, when I got into the league, I think I had that somewhat of that mentality right away because I was like, you know, I want to play this game as long as I possibly can. You know, you can't play it as long as you can coach it. Um, but you want it to go as as long as possible. you got to do every little thing, get every little leg up. And um, obviously there's so much money and, and, you know, things in the sport that – a lot of guys in the NBA are trying to find those little things to get them to the next level and to keep them in the league. Um, but, you know, I just do my best to, to stay on top of every little thing and, and um, you know, take care of my body, uh, take care of my mind. And, and, you know, those are certainly things I learned from Coach. Uh, how tight is the Duke alumni community in the NBA? I mean, there are a lot of you guys now. I mean, obviously you're going to be you're going to you know, feel some connection with Mason, Miles, Kyle Singler, Seth Curry, you know, the guys you played with. But does it extend to, like, Justice Windows, Jalil Okafor, who came after you, or J.J. Redick, Mike Dunleavy, who came before you? Oh, without a doubt. And, um, you know, especially, you know, we see each other sometimes during the summer, whether it be at K Academy or different times around um, Durham. Um, but, you know, when we see each other, it's it's as if we were teammates at Duke. You know, that, that – family that connection um spans way beyond just the time you know individually you were there um and, and that makes it special there, there are people that look out for you um they want to know how you're doing um and, and you know the nba can be a little bit lonely you know obviously you're with your teammates but you're on the road a lot you're away from family and um, when you can go on the road and see different people that um, are like family to you that's that's pretty special do you get to pay much attention to Duke hoops while you're in the NBA? And part and parcel with that question, any any thoughts about this year's team? Yeah, I've gotten to, uh, you know, I actually went to um, their first exhibition game. I was in town um, because how yeah, it all worked fact, out with I, Atlanta. I, I, saw, I was going to say, I saw on Instagram, you took your uh, son or daughter, uh, you took a little one with you. I saw that. Yeah, that was my son. Um, it was his first Duke game. Um, couldn't quite make it through the whole thing, uh, but he was uh, enamored by the ball. Um, but no, <laughs> I'm really excited uh, uh, for them. You know, they got a lot of talent. Obviously, you got to be healthy. Um, but uh, you know, the the staff has shown in the past that they let their guys get healthy and put them in a really good position. And there's a ton of talent on that roster. They're they're, you know, obviously, what was it a day or two ago? They just just where everybody said they're number one and and they're you know the 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 favorite going into the season and I think when I look at the roster there's no doubt that's the case. Is there any um, sort of collegiate rivalry that goes on among NBA players like when you run into Carolina players or Kentucky players to do, do you sort of go hey, hey we're number one? <laughs> yeah, I've said that to a few of my teammates here, um, uh, <laughs> and then when. Uh, you know, when the season gets going and teams start playing each other, you know, you can put a little dinner bet on some of the games, too. Uh, so that's that happens quite a bit. Uh, that must be fun. All right, I, I have to ask you this, and you're allowed to say pass, okay? <laughs> you played on the Lakers with Kobe Bryant. You played with Austin Rivers when he was at Duke. <laughs> Who passes the ball more, Kobe or Austin? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, that's a good question. Uh, both, uh, as as we well know, are definitely scorers. Um, you know, I, I Kobe was interesting. He he had some games where you know he really let the game come to him and um, would give it up. You know, I I played with Kobe where he was basically our point guard and and he would give it up a lot. And then obviously other times where he was super aggressive um, and looking for a shot. And uh, Austin, similarly, you know, obviously I only got to play one year with him. Um, but, you know, as the, se- as the season went on that year, uh, we really put the ball in his hands more and more. And obviously he was aggressive to score. Um, but he looked to pass it too. And, um, you know, that, that's that's a nice answer, I think. It's probably not what you're looking for. But uh, <laughs> uh, they, they picked their moments. Both of them picked their moments. No, no, that's okay. That's a perfectly good question. That's a perfectly good answer. Hey, what's your what's your favorite memory from from being at Duke? Um, was it the thirty six point game when you came back from injury? Um, everyone remembers that. God, that was just unbelievable. Yeah, I mean that that's certainly one that stands out um, as as being a favorite. And on top of it, you know, obviously everything was amazing that I I played so well. Um, but to win against a really good team, I think Miami was what number two in the country at the time, um, and it, and it was an important win. You know that whole that whole season, uh, senior year, where you know you kind of want to leave your legacy, and um, and then my foot, you know, pops, and I have to kind of decide whether I'm gonna come back and try and play on it or just have surgery and end it and end my career. Um, and it was a brutal decision on me because, you know, you got to think about the future. Obviously I want to play in the NBA. Um, but at the same time, like I said, you want to, you know, leave something, um, and to be remembered. And, um, you know, it's funny. I, I really practiced one day before that game. I, you know, I was doing <laughs> some movement workouts, but I only got into one practice where I played any, any bit of contact. Um, and it was very short practice. It was only like 30 minutes, and um, coach said, oh, well, you look pretty good. You want to play? And I said, at that point, there were so many games, only a few games left in the season. I said, sure, why not? And honestly, going into it, I figured, you know, maybe I, I go in and get a minute and give some kind of boost, you know, emotionally against a really good team. And I called my parents and said, I'm going to try and play tomorrow. Um, you know, love obviously, they're, they're in Raleigh. So they were like, oh, we'll, we'll be there and um, cheer you on. And, and then before the game, coach said, "You're gonna, you're gonna start." And I said, <laughs> "Okay, like I'll, I'll, I'll give my my best." Um, and one of the, probably the coolest moments, not just in my Duke career, but in my life, certainly in my sport life, um, was when uh, the starting lineup was called and, and they called my name, and uh, the support I felt from the the student section in the whole arena lifted me. I think. Um, and gave me somewhat of an emotional high that you know, I'll never forget. And it was it was as if you couldn't hear anything. It was so loud. Um, you didn't even hear the cheers. It was just like white noise. Um, and that, that'll be something I'll never forget and, um, you know, something I'll cherish forever. Um, hey, and uh, speaking on behalf of the fans, um, we, we appreciate all, the, all that you did, all the effort you guys put in. Um, I know it is not easy. Um, I, I, I'm going to close with this question, and, and I, I, I warned you about this in advance. Um, I've asked this question of many, many other Duke players that we've interviewed here on the DBR podcast. Ryan Kelly, give me your best, craziest Coach K story. <laughs> what wild, weird thing did Coach K do to try and motivate you guys, or, or what is your, you know, sort of your best, funniest, perhaps, memory of Coach K when you were at Duke? Yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of them. Um, but you I think can, you my can do more than one. <laughs> no, no, this this is my favorite. I think, um, you know, I think I think it was my sophomore year, um, or maybe my junior year, and and um, you know, I was I was tended to be the player that made the right play. Um, you know, I didn't do anything overly flashy. I made the extra pass. You know, tried to tried to just make the right basketball play, and I think that's kind of what the coaching staff and my teammates came to expect of me. And um, you know, that was my role, and. Um, we were playing a, a game early in the season. I couldn't tell you who it was against, um, but it was a team we were beating up on pretty good. And um, we got a steal, and I had the ball driven up the court, and it was a two-on-one. And um, 
Normal Ryan would have just made a nice easy bounce pass to, to the guy trailing to my left, um, but instead, for whatever reason, I decided to try and throw a behind-the-back pass, um, and Uh-oh. it was tipped out and went, went out of bounds. <laughs> uh, I might have turned it over, probably. I would, I would imagine I turned it over, and uh, I don't know if it was a media timeout or if Coach called a timeout, but he came all the way onto the court <laughs> and uh, with, with a little bit of language sprinkled in, said, what the bleep were you thinking? And I, you know, I just put my head down and said, you know, I didn't say anything. I walked to the bench and it was a full timeout. And that's the only thing he he repeated that over and over again, the entire timeout, <laughs> putting, a, <laughs> putting, putting a different inflection on uh, like a, a different word in the sentence. So he'd go, <laughs> what the bleep were you thinking? What the fuck were you thinking? <laughs> and my <laughs> my fa- my favorite part, and you know, as a as a kid, that you know, I was sitting there, you know, obviously scared and and going, what was I thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. But after the game, what made it all so funny was my two cousins were sitting behind the bench, and <laughs> they were right near the huddle, so they heard it all. <laughs> And they weren't cursing or anything, but they were literally saying bleep and walking around going, what the bleep are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty funny. And uh, I, I, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, Ryan, I appreciate you spending the time um, and chatting with me a little bit. Good luck, good luck, good luck on the Atlanta Hawks. Um, uh, by the way, have you moved your family here? Not here yet. Actually, uh, my wife's uh, pregnant with our second child coming at the end of December, um, a girl, and we're uh, she's going to be having the baby in Raleigh because it's so late. Um, so, uh, yeah, she's she's actually coming down today to visit for a week and then heads back up to North Carolina, and then she can't travel for a bit. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, going to miss out on some things, but um, it'll be good to see them. Well, not not too bad. Raleigh's a. I, I've made the trip from Atlanta up to Raleigh Durham many times. It, as you know, it's a pretty easy five five and a half hour drive. It's really not too tough. Um, yeah, and, exactly. Uh, I, yeah, I, I I hope this is the start of a long long career with the Hawks. Love having Dukies here in town with me. And <laughs> thanks so much. Um, thanks for joining us here on the DBR podcast, sharing your memories of Duke. And and again, good luck on on the NBA career. Hope it continues to go really really well. Greatly appreciate that, and uh, go Hawks, go Duke. All right, thanks to uh, thanks to Ryan Kelly again for being on the show and uh, for answering our questions. Uh, I I was particularly excited that Jason got around to asking the question about Kobe Bryant versus Austin Rivers because <laughs> I think I think I was the one that originally suggested it, and I was only I was only suggesting it as half of a joke. Um, well, yeah, it but, was kind of uh, funny. You, you you suggested it. Donald loved the question. And I was like, oh, my God, no, I can't ask that. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, that's a great question. And his answer well, was perfectly appropriate, you know? And it would be – I think it would be it would be one thing if, if Ryan Kelly had any sort of discernible beef with any other basketball player that we've ever seen. Um, but, I mean, as far as I can tell as a fan – uh, I, I I don't see Ryan Kelly walking around with a big chip on his shoulder about other guys and, and no. other players on his no. team. So <laughs> I, I think it was fine. And, and and to his credit, he was very diplomatic about the answer because um, because uh, I think we I think we all know that that neither of those guys is a is necessarily a fun person to expect a pass from. Um, yes. Yeah. But I, I, but I, I guess I, I'll, I'll go back to you, Jason. Why don't you tell us about about that interview? Well, it, it, it was fun. It was really nice. And I'm glad the Hawks were able to arrange this for me. And just so folks know, I've reached out to a bunch of NBA teams and said, hey, can we have conversations so, uh, with, you know, with your Duke players? So I'm hoping that this is the first of many that we get this season. Um, uh, I you know, can't promise anything, but, um, but I've gotten some. Oh, and, uh, pop- and Jason, and Jason yeah. the best part of what you just said is that you reached out to several teams. Some of, these, some of these colleges only have like one or two teams they can reach out to. We have pretty much what like 13 14 teams that we can reach out to uh that have Duke players oh, yeah. on them so I think that's that oh, yeah. in itself is great yes yeah uh so I, I'm, I'm hoping I'll hear from others um by the way I want to uh say to Ryan um congratulations on uh his second child uh, on the way he mentioned that at the very end of the of the interview um his wife is back in Raleigh and uh, I think that's really great um uh and very exciting for them obviously uh and then you know the part of it I liked the most was 
Um, when he talked about the other Duke guys in the NBA, I mean, Donald, you, you brought up how many of them there are. And, and Ryan, you know, I asked him about it, and Ryan really said there's a connection among all these guys. They, they, they know each other, um, even the ones that they weren't in school together. They, 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 uh, they, they acknowledge each other when, they, when they're in town together. They go back to Duke um, over the summers and the such, and, and they all stay in touch. And there, there's, a, there's a family sense that you get there, and I, th- I thought that was really great. I was glad that he, that he brought that up. I, 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 I would get in the Coach K story in a second, but I think touching on the, the camaraderie, the brotherhood, um, if you notice the, uh, the team was wearing shirts uh, this weekend that said the brotherhood and the Duke basketball logo on it, which is something that they uh, like to pride themselves on. And I think it's great that they do that. I think it's also cool that they have uh, the confidence. He has the confidence to walk into a locker room of a team that he just joined and basically tell people exactly who he, who he is, what school he came from, that his school is number one in the country. I think that's like sometimes it's very hard to walk into a new workplace and just and just tell people that where you came from is the best. But I, I think it's awesome that we have a, a guy that's confident enough to come in uh, after three years in and come into a new locker room and say, hey, I'm from Duke, and we have the number one team in the country. How's your school doing? Uh, I think that's pretty cool that, that they kind of have that uh, – that funny rivalry between some of these teams and, and as within some of these locker rooms. Um, but I think the Coach K story was hilarious. Um, I, I think that's – you, you challenged him to come up with a I know that, on par, and that was great. I thought he did very well at, at meeting the challenge. I, I, the inflections. The part that cracked me up was he said Coach K kept on repeating that phrase to him with different inflections. What yeah. the blank were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I cra- I was laughing. I was laughing really hard with that. I, I was going to say, you, Donald, your point about you know coming in the locker room and and you know being proud of your team. Um, he is kind of lucky. I mean, on the Atlanta Hawks, there aren't there aren't a lot of guys from big, big, big time programs. I mean, the Hawks have Mike Scott, who was at Virginia. Um, I got Tim Hardaway Jr. who was at Michigan, but, but it's not like he's walking in the locker room with a bunch of Carolina and Kentucky and Kansas guys, just the nature of who the, who the Hawks have on their team. It's not a lot of guys from big time programs. So I imagine that Ryan can puff out his chest a little bit more as a result. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think getting back to the coach case story, I think what gives it away there, there is a story, right? And if it's, a story can be awesome, but it can be told poorly. I think he was a great storyteller. I think that made the story come to life. You can actually physically yes. feel yourself in the huddle and Coach K is staring at you to face like, what the bleep were you thinking? And you're just kind of looking like, I don't know, Coach. It, it, like, and you could just – like that was a great story, but it was also the way he told it that made it even better. Well, and the, and the best part I think was well, – sorry, say it really quick. The best part was Ryan Kelly th- saying – he was like, I don't know what I was thinking. What was I doing? Why did I do that? Behind the back What was I thinking? <laughs> no, it was, great. It was perfect. Coach K is the master motivator, and part of that is being the uh, master psychologist, right? He, he got in Ryan Kelly's head, and Ryan Kelly never did a stupid thing like that again. And, uh, I mean, granted, that's, that's – as he noted, that's the kind of player that he is. But, um, but yeah, it, 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 that, that's what really made it stick with him was, was just the repeated, uh, you know, admonishment of, about, about that mistake he made. I enjoyed, um, Jason, you asking him about the, uh, his coming back from that injury against the Miami game late in his senior season. You know, it, thinking back on that season, the team was really, really good all year and, and didn't have Ryan Kelly for, I think, almost the entire ACC season. And he was kind of the... He, you know, he was he was the the big question mark about if he was going to come back. That team was going to look was going to be very complete. They they had they had players at every position, and uh, and I don't I don't know what you guys remember. I remember watching that game and just being beside myself at at how awesome he was. And it's even more incredible now to look back on it and think that he only got half an hour of practice with the other guys before playing in that game. Right, and Coach well, that K. Game, Remember the first, the, the iconic moment of that, I, for me, for that entire season was when he launched that first, that second three in the, early, in the, for early in the game. It was like he hit the first two threes, he hit the second three, and he turns and runs down the court with his hand out, and he says, I still got it, I still got it. And, like, you could see the entire bench just erupting, and he's just, like, kind of, like, any worries about whether I could sit back and slow this offense has just been silenced. I still got this, we're still good. Uh, and they went out and beat Miami. So I, I think that was, yeah, that was the iconic moment with him coming back. Then. So 
So thanks again to Ryan Kelly for doing that interview. I hope everybody enjoyed that. We wanted to touch on a quick bit of recruiting news. Duke got a commitment last week. It's the early signing period right now for basketball. And Duke got a commitment from um, from shooting guard Gary Trent Jr. He's out of Apple Valley, Minnesota, a town that we have now taken two players from in the last couple of years because Tyus Jones was from there as well. Uh, he's a bigger guy, 6'5", for a, for a guard. Um, any, any thoughts from you guys about uh, Gary Trent Jr.'s commitment? I know that he's now the second player and the second shooting guard to be uh, selected from this class. I know that Duke likes to pile up on, on wing players, but any thoughts on, on Gary Trent, Donald? Uh, yeah, I, I, th- I think it's a great pickup. It's one of the, the jewels of this, uh, this next class uh, that people have been shooting for. Um, obviously, there's been talk about whether he is a package deal with uh, Wendell Carter, who is one of the top-ranked guys in the country, uh, if not the top-ranked guy in the country. I don't follow the, the rankings because they kind of get fluid uh, around this time of the year. Um, but they have been the two prizes, right? And th- these are the two guys uh, that we've been shooting for, and it's been talked that there is a package deal. Well, I mean, we got one of those, and uh, the only other uh, th- there was only one school that was um, – common among their final five and Duke was that school. So uh, hopefully that bodes well for us getting Wendell Carter as well. I hope, uh, and I, and I'm looking forward to seeing Gary Trent next year. I think he's a stud um, and, and think he's going to do very well here. So uh, that's a really good pickup uh, for us. And, and hopefully it, it helps us uh, secure uh, yet again, another great class. So, uh, that, oh, go ahead, Jason. I was going to say uh, Gary Trent um, is a very physically mature and physically strong guy. He scores. He was a big time scorer um, in in some important international tournaments that he played in, uh, and and also in in the high school all star tournaments that he's been in and the such the AAU stuff. Um, and he really uses his physical strength um, to to create separation. To create, he's got a really nice mid range game. He's not super explosive. He's not great around the rim, but he's pretty good. Um, and he has a very very nice, very fluid um, shot from the outside. Do either of you remember his father at all? The Shack of the Mac? No, I don't. Um, I, I don't remember seeing him play. I, I think I was like, I don't know. I was young, but I, I don't remember watching him play. Um, so his, fa- but- his father, Gary Trent, was, was known as the Shack of the Mac. Um, uh, he, was, uh, he was a little bit bigger than his son, um, both in terms of, of height and uh, girth, so to speak. He was just... He, he was an absolute um, force underneath the basket. He went on, he played in the NBA for about eight or nine years, I think, something like that, maybe as many as 10, maybe as many as 10 years. Um, Gary Trent was a, a really, really nice, really good ball player, one of the better mid-major ball players out there, um, you know, back in the, I guess it was the early 90s, perhaps, early mid, maybe late 90s now that I think about it. Um, but uh, uh, I, I'm real excited to have this kid. I, I think he's going to be very, very, very good. Um, the, the class of 2017 is supposed to be um, a really good high school class. Uh, a lot of people are expecting Duke to get three, maybe even four or five um, uh, uh, top-tier players, and Gary Trent is the first of those. Um, so, yeah, it, it's great to have him on board. Does Duke have too many wing players for next year? Well, I seeing as I have, no idea who's, I, I have no idea who's <laughs> going to be on the roster next year. Is is Frank Jackson going to be on the roster next year? I don't think any is of us Grayson, necessarily know. Grayson Allen going to be on the roster next year? Grayson Allen's not going to be on the Grayson Allen's graduating early. Uh, uh, he, he, is that yeah. for sure? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, my understanding is he's taken an accelerated program, and the plan is to get his degree um, at the end of this season. He may have to take one or two more summer school classes or something. I'm not sure. But okay. the, the plan, I think Grayson Allen is the for sure thing that he will not, that, that this is his last season at Duke. Look, we've gotten one more year out of him than we probably should have. Sure. Um, so, so Frank Jackson, Luke Kennard, um, uh, but uh, aside gone. from that. But you'll have, you'll have um, Trent and then O'Connell. I don't know if he'll play at all next year. But, uh, yeah, and, then, Duke, and, then, hey, and then, hey, how about Jack White, who, who, who appeared in both games this weekend, right? Yeah. Um, it, it is, I, I mean, he's not, he's, he's not getting minutes over, over Gary Trent, but, um, but, but you never know. It's too early to know, and there's still a lot of guys who – um, Duke is considering, and Duke is. Look, we're looking at some point guards. Um, they're, they're, Kevin Knox. Um, we're, there are a lot of there are a lot of really good players that we're looking at um, who could come in uh, and play on the perimeter. Um, but I'll, I'll say this: if it is Frank Jackson, Gary Trent, and Luke Kennard, that's a really, really good. That's a really good perimeter team. That's, um, that's a lot of scoring. That's a, that'd be great. 
that is a lot of score. That is three guys who score in a variety of ways. And yeah, uh, uh, but don't get me excited about next year yet. We still got this year. There's, there's a few more games left for this year. Let's quickly touch on football. Um, if Duke hadn't beaten Notre Dame on the road this year, I think that this might have been the, the definitive highlight of the season, and, and it may even still be for you guys. Um, Duke beat UNC in a, in a game that was actually very similar to that Notre Dame game. Um, it, the final score was 28-27, to 27, but UNC jumped out to a very quick 14-0 lead, and then Duke just crawled back um, and, and managed to, to score in the third quarter um, and, and hold on while UNC made a couple of drives. Duke killed the clock late in the game really well with a, with a drive that didn't end up um, resulting in a score, but that, that took a lot of time off and kind of prevented Carolina from having enough time to come back and win. So the Blue Devils are back in possession of the victory bell. Uh, Donald, were you able to watch the Duke UNC game? And if so, what were your impressions of this, uh, of this you know, pretty impressive performance? So I was in, I was in Columbus, Ohio, uh, uh, and I was not able to see the whole game. I was able to see highlights uh, yesterday. Um, but what I took away from it is, I mean, I think we touched on this last week. I think you said, it, Jason, this is the best North Carolina team that we've beaten uh, in, in this time. And uh, I was actually hanging out with a friend of mine who went to UNC. Uh, we are discussing the game going back and forth. And he, and he mentioned the first thing he said was, Coach Cut is a hell of a coach. Um, and, and just to, you know, this is, a, this is where, you know, the point of the season where a lot of teams say, oh, we're, we're three and six, we're not going bowling. Uh, what, and we're playing UNC, uh, you know, 15th ranked in the country. Let's just pack it in. Let's just play hard. But, like, you know, let's just go home and, and kind of get ready for next season. Coach had them coached up, uh, especially on, sh- on, a, on a short week. Um, that is incredible. Um, you know, and it started out, started out slow. Obviously, we started out with that uh, 14 nothing deficit. Uh, but we did the same thing against Notre Dame. And just like you said, Sam, we caught back up slowly but surely. And then we took the lead, and for the entire fourth quarter, we held it. Um, that is something that two teams of the past wouldn't have done. Uh, and that is something that I was very impressed to see uh, happen uh, here on Thursday night. Uh, two years ago, I was at the game. That was on Thursday night. There was a lot of electricity in the air. There was a lot of, uh, of buildup, and we got smoked. And, and, and this time around, people there's a lot of people who kind of had that same feeling, especially given that this North Carolina team was a lot better than that was two years ago. Um, and I think that was uh, that is kind of what makes this game a little bit more shocking. Uh, but also, it, I shouldn't be shocked because Coach Cutcliffe always has our teams prepared. We've been talking about it over the last three weeks where our team, even though we were losing these games by three, by three, by seven, uh, or by ten, they were still in these games until the very end. And I think that mentality is what led us to help to, to finish off UNC, and when we had this one-point lead for the entire fourth quarter, they were able to play 15 minutes of the best football of their lives and hold the game and, and get the victory bell back and keep it in, in Wallace Wade. So I think that's great. I think it's tremendous effort by our team, uh, and I was, I was absolutely ecstatic that, that they pulled it off. Jason, this, tell me, Jason, tell me about Daniel Jones. I'm sorry? I said, tell me about Daniel Jones. Well, it, it, he had a fabulous game. Uh, the kid shows unbelievable poise for uh, for for just a freshman. Um, he, he's done a really nice job, I think, of identifying times to throw and times to run. Um, and Duke's doing a really nice job of working him into the rushing attack, um, in addition to the the passing game. And uh, it, he was very accurate. Um, but I, I want to talk about our defense because uh, our our defense won that game. Um, after we took the lead near the end of the third quarter. Um, UNC returned the kickoff all the way down to the Duke 25. And I thought, oh, they're about to march it in again. This, this UNC team supposedly is one of the best offensive teams in the country. Mitch Trubisky is going to be a first-round a- NFL draft pick as a quarterback. Um, uh, they, they, you know, they've got talent all over the field. I was sure – they're starting on the 25, and I was sure they were going to waltz that ball into the end zone, and they went nowhere. And, and then the fourth quarter starts – and the vaunted UNC offensive machine went for a total of 31 yards in the entire fourth quarter. 31 yards in the fourth quarter. And our, our D was so impressive. They got those first two drives 
where they were moving the ball, especially through the air, really with a lot of ease. And and by the way, I want to thank Larry Fedora. I thought he did a wonderful job of going to the ground when he was doing nothing but succeeding in the air. And every time they ran the ball, I breathed a sigh of relief. Um, and uh, I, you know, and, and so Larry Fedora helped us out by overthinking this game, I think. But but I um, the real thing I want. I already said the defense was great, but I, I want to touch on. Um, what I'm going to call the single most important non-scoring drive in Duke's modern football history. There was a there was about seven minutes. Or, I'm sorry, there's about eight minutes left on the clock, um, and uh, UNC punts and downs the ball on our one yard line. Uh, and there's eight minutes left. And at that moment, as a result of that punt that that put us in the shadow of our goalposts. Uh, ESPN's prediction graph, you know, they, they use power rankings, all this other stuff. Their prediction graph said that even though Duke was leading the game by one point, they thought that UNC had about a 55% chance of winning the game because we were sitting on our one-yard line. And we proceeded to go on a 13-play drive that ate up uh, right around seven minutes of the clock. We did not score a single point on that drive, but it ended with Daniel Jones pooch punching the ball down to the, to the six-yard line and UNC having maybe a minute of time left to, to come back and no timeouts. Um, and according to ESPN, we started that drive with a 55% chance of winning. By the time that drive ended, when UNC got the ball at their six, Duke's chances of winning were up to 91%. Again, I think that that was the single most important non-scoring drive you'll ever see a Duke football team have. Uh, and it was, it was beautiful. It was the, the offensive strategy on it was great. Um, I, I just can't say enough about how well this team executed when they needed to. They didn't get down when they were down 14-0. They just, they continued to gut it out. And I loved, loved, loved seeing the second, the, the last second ticked off the clock. Those guys made a beeline to the victory bell. Um, and, and it was just a ton of fun. So exciting. Um, in a year when, when we've lost a lot of close games, I mean, look, think about this. If I told you that Duke would beat UNC and Notre Dame, and that we would almost, that we would come really close. We'd be right there at the end against Louisville and Virginia Tech. You would think we were on our way to like a nine or 10 win season, wouldn't you? We've had so many close games that just slipped through our grasp this year. We've had so many games where um, w- when we played inferior teams, uh, we didn't quite do what, what probably we could have against them. Um, you know, thinking of games like the Wake and the Virginia games. But uh, these guys still have a chance to make a bowl game. And if nothing else, I mean, a season when you beat UNC and Notre Dame, that's a success. That's a very successful season. Yeah. It shows they're learning. It shows they're taking every every lesson that we've had over j- not just these big victories like we had against uh, uh, Notre Dame, but also these you know the defeats against Wake Forest and, and UVA, uh, also the close losses that we had uh, against Virginia Tech, uh, Georgia Tech, and Louisville. They're taking these lessons and they applied all of that to this game. And I think that's good that we've seen a team that's still steadily improving and taking what they learned from the weeks before and putting it together and it actually paying off. I think that is the, the best part is that you could tell that they have been working hard. They've been improving. They've been getting better. Um, and it showed on Thursday night. And I've just been impressed as, as you guys note, um, by the, by the poise of this team, you know, they're, they're only four and six, but the way they carry themselves, I mean, being able to come back against Notre Dame and then this weekend against UNC, they, they have all the confidence that, that they're going to be right in it, and they have been. And, and we noted how in recent weeks against Louisville and against Virginia Tech, Duke has, if not won, they've at least kept those games close. And, and you're seeing it now um, turn into wins for them because they, they, don't get, they don't get down on themselves when they, when they are losing to a perhaps superior opponent. They, they stick with it. They stick with their game plan. Daniel Jones has been... Um, has really improved throughout the season, and and it, it finally resulted in a in a big upset victory this time. And who knows if it, you know if they can beat UNC, um, they certainly are capable of beating Pittsburgh and Miami. Um, although Pittsburgh did have a, a stunning win yesterday against Clemson, which uh, which kind of shakes up a little bit perhaps the uh, national title picture. Um, but but Duke is is certainly. Um, poised and and capable of of going on a little run here at the end of the season and ending up in a bowl game. Um, so does it, do you guys have any other closing thoughts about football? Um, if you yeah, wanted to touch on anything I, I, else in the ACC, it was kind of a, a, a nutty day in college football. Well, yeah, the number two, three, and four teams in the, in the uh, 
you know, in the rankings, uh, in, in the national championship rankings, all three of them lost. I don't know what that does. I think Louisville, um, at Louisville and Ohio State are two very, very happy teams today. <laughs> uh, but I, the, the last thing I want to say about football was I want to fess up. I want to raise my hand and say, yes, it was me who last week on the podcast really thought we were going to get our asses kicked by UNC. I am so, so, you know, we talk about our predictions all the time. I'm really glad that I was very, very, very wrong about that prediction. And I, I, I talked to a, a guy who was on the team when I was there a few years ago at, right before the game. And he said the same thing. He was like, I just, I think we're going to get our, our asses beat today. And it didn't happen that way. So good for this Duke team for, for proving, proving the fans wrong, I guess. Boy, I'll tell you, when it was 14 nothing, and, and they had the, those first two drives for them, they scored with remarkable ease. I mean, the first touchdown they were drive, I think that, 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 guy was, that guy was five yards clear of anybody else in the end zone. I was like, is there anyone going to cover him? When it was 14 nothing, I thought, they're about to put a, you know, a 50 spot on us. I really thought they were. Like I said, I love it when I'm wrong. <laughs> I think that, that wraps it for football. We'll, we'll move into our sort of final segments here. We, uh, since the season is back, we'll go back to uh, picking a player of the week, um, which, is the, which is our sort of standard practice during basketball season. So I'll start with Donald. Um, who is your opening week player of the week? Uh, okay, so I did a little strategy, and honestly, I thought I was going to go second. Um, but so I'm going to go with, uh, with apologies to Grayson Allen because I think somebody else is going to mention him. I hope one of you two will mention him. I'm going to go with Frank Jackson. Uh, I thought he, you know, the first two games of, of, of a freshman's career are always uh, very important to get off on the, on the right start, and he did exactly that. He was great on offense. He was wonderful on defense uh, and doing it off the bench as well. Um, that's something that, you know, a freshman of his caliber is used to starting all these games. And, he, you know, to start uh, on the bench is something that is an adjustment for a lot of freshmen. But he took that in stride. Um, he has settled in a little bit. You know, I think we talked a little bit about um, the game coming to him uh, in the preseason. Uh, but he did just that in these first two games and played very well in both of them. So uh, my, my uh, kudos for this week go to Frank Jackson. Um, uh, with apologies to Grayson Allen and to Frank Jackson, I'm going to take Luke Kennard. And, and here's why. Um, I, in both these games, um, it seemed like, you know, there were times that Duke was struggling a little bit, not to, so much to score, but to, to be efficient on offense. And Luke Kennard was a model of efficiency in these two games. Um, he had 16 points against Marist on 14 shots, shot 7 of 14 from the field against Grand Canyon. Um, he was 5 of 7 from the field, 14 points on 7, on seven shots. That's, that's pretty darn efficient. Um, Kennard had, uh, had six assists against Grand Canyon to lead the team against Marist. He had nine rebounds. Um, this is a guy who's doing a little bit of everything without a lot of fanfare. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been, I've been singing his praises for a while. I've been saying that, uh, Luke Kennard would be the next 2000 point scorer in Duke history. Um, and, and, uh, he, he showed once again, why my prediction I think is going to be correct. And by the way, I want to add, so last year he struggled with his three point shot at times. Um, so far this year, he's four of eight from, from long range, from long distance. Um, and he is, he is unbelievably good. Uh, mid-range, short-range, um, you know, his ability to get off shots with his right or his left hand is really, really impressive. I, I think uh, we all picked Grayson Allen to lead the team in scoring. Um, we all think Jason Tatum's going to be a big-time scorer. Luke Kennard's going to be the third really, really big-time scorer for this team, as well as Frank Jackson did. Um, I'm not so sure that that's going to last when we play better teams. Luke Kennard's scoring will hold up um, all season long. All right, well, in a in a... Wonderful upset. Grayson Allen is not winning any player of the week shout outs this week because I'm taking Emil Jefferson partially uh, because of the 20 points and 16 rebounds he put up over the weekend. And he was especially poised against that Grand Canyon team that we said, uh, you know, looked ready to ready and, and uh, to, to play against a high quality team like Duke. Um, but just for being able to see Jefferson back on the court, um, obviously we saw him in the preseason, but to see him in the regular season doing all the things that we making all the little plays, um, playing a lot of good defense on the perimeter, getting rebounds, getting the ball back up in the air, um, making a few really nice passes. I think that my player of the week this week is Neil Jefferson. So um, did we just give, yeah, he had we five. Just give Grayson Allen, 
Did we just give Grayson Allen the Coach K Coach of the Year treatment? We, we, exactly, honestly, that's exactly oh. what we did. We, listen, we expect no, a lot Grayson, of like, we, Grayson We're Allen. sorry, man. We're really sorry. We didn't mean to do that. I figured what are you would pick of. You know, the guy only scored 40 points this weekend. So, um, I, I, I don't know. He's, he's just going to have to play a little better. Yeah. <laughs> um, he also, he also way, missed, I, I love, he missed I love, three free throws, which is not characteristic of him. I was yeah, going to say, I true. love your pick of Jefferson. I thought Jefferson's five block shots against Grand Canyon were, were really big. Um, like I said, when we were recapping that game, they were going to the basket with impunity, and it was Jefferson who, who stepped over and said, no, 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 you're, you're not going to do this anymore. And he started blocking shots and altering shots, and it changed the complexion of that game. So great choice there on Jefferson. All right, um, let's wrap with parting shots. Uh, Jason, do you have a parting shot for this week? So you guys just said it. My parting shot was, for folks who have not read my rant on the board, (laughs) I am on the bulletin board, I'm going to rant again. Um, I cannot believe, I cannot believe ESPN, uh, they have these, uh, all these experts, they have more than 30 college basketball announcers, commentators, experts that they polled. And they asked them for their national champions. They asked them for their final four. They asked them for their player of the year and their coach of the year. And Duke's name is all over all of it. Duke's name. We, we are the overwhelming choice to win the national title. 21 out of the 31 said we'd win the national title. There was only one person who didn't say that Duke would make the final four um, uh, in the player of the year. Grayson Allen um, was the overwhelming. He, he won that as well. 14 of the 31 folks said Grayson Allen would, would, would win player of the year. One person said Harry Giles would. Um, there was no one else who got more than four player of the year votes. And then suddenly we come to coach of the year. And only three people pick Coach K for coach of the year. And look, I, I understand. I get that coach of the year is typically given to someone who overachieves, someone who takes a team that people didn't think was going to be quite as good as they were and made them better than they were. You know, there'll be someone in the top five or top seven or top 10 this year who maybe wasn't expected to be quite in the top 20. And one's going to go, oh, that guy's coach of the year. And I understand that. But right now, today, we don't know who that team is. And the notion that you would pick anyone but Coach K for coach of the year right now is just idiotic. It's insane. It makes no sense at all. Coach K has assembled the best team in the country. Everyone agrees they're the best team in the country. He's done it with incredible recruiting. He's done it with incredible player development of guys like Grayson Allen and Emile Jefferson and Matt Jones, who who weren't super all-pro studs coming out of high school, um, and he turned them into great players. The idea that you would pick anyone but Coach K for player of the year preseason is idiotic. It doesn't make any sense at all. And, and the fact that some of these experts were picking guys like Bill Self, or John Calipari, or Rick Pitino, or Tom Izzo. Excuse me, they're in the exact same situation as Coach K. They are at the Blue Blood programs. They get all the recruits that they want, except they aren't as good as Coach K. They don't have as good a team as Duke does this year. Everyone acknowledges that. It's just, it's silly, and I don't get it. Coach K has not won a player of the, I'm sorry, Coach K has not won a Coach of the Year award, like, in almost 20 years. This is absurd. It's ridiculous. We need to acknowledge. Everyone knows he's the best of all time. You know what? We need to put some hardware to agree with the fact that he's the best of all time. And one of the reasons I'm looking forward to Duke going 40-0 and this year and winning the national title and setting records and all that other kind of stuff is because maybe if we go 40-0, and Coach K will win Coach of the Year. Because if we go 39-1, and I bet they're going to give it to someone like Leonard Hamilton. And you know what? Their idiocy was cemented when they uh, did not give him the Coach of the Year in 2015 for taking eight scholarship players to the national championship. That's something that if, if they took, if other players, other coaches took eight scholarship players to the ACC tournament, they would have gotten the national coach of the year. But well, and that, he won it and all. That, and, and that was probably his best, in my opinion, of the last like 15 years, that was probably his best coaching job that anyone has ever done. Uh, and that 2015, that 2015 team was the year where he said, oh, you know what? Man-to-man isn't working? Fine. I'll have my team play zone. And they played great zone for a while, and it got their confidence back up. P- do people forget where that team was in January? That team looked like it was going to struggle to make the NCAA tournament at one point in January. Remember the long march to 1,000 wins where he kept on losing games when he was supposed to be his 1,000th win? And then he turned around, and you're right, Donald, they won the national title. How, how is that not the best coaching job in the country? It's stupid. It's stupid. Jason, how do you really feel? <laughs> uh, Donald, your parting shot. 
Yeah, follow that up, Donald. <laughs> well, I actually have a I actually have a rant on my own. So uh, I think about uh, there's an article that I read yesterday. Uh, I believe it was yesterday or today about uh, the one and done uh, like situation in college, and it focused on Calipari and how he believes that he basically invented the one and done era essentially, and that it was frowned upon until uh, until in his mind. Coach K started doing it, and he had a quote that basically said it was okay until Coach K did it, and now it, when he did it, it was, oh, he's adjusting to the time, and basically ragged on the fact that now we are getting a bunch of these uh, one-and-done type players, or, or just basically players, in my mind, he's just salty that we're getting players that a year ago would, he, would have been going to Kentucky um, instead of to Duke. Um, and I, I think, I want to touch on that because one, I think Calipari is just salty. Like, all the salt in the world, Lowry should sponsor him um, because he has all the salt um, and, and none for my mashed potatoes. Second of all, I think Kentucky, they are different than Duke, obviously. I mean, there's a lot of things that even people who are not fans of either team can take those two programs and say there's a lot of differences between the two. And Calipari highlights that. He's one of those guys that when, you know, they, they interview a lot of these players that have been recruited by both teams. And I think you know, a lot of their takeaways are, you know, Coach K comes in and preaches the fact that Duke is a family. Duke is, it will set you up for life. You'll, you know, you get a degree. You're going to be part of a network. You're going to be part of this Duke community. And Kentucky basically says, we'll get you to the NBA. Um, and I think those are two differences. And I think that is the reason why we have been getting a lot of these players the last few years. I, I think the, the just to the NBA uh, pitch is no longer working for all of these players. A lot of these players are recognizing that they do have to go to college, and if they are going to go to college, they, do, they just don't want to go to a, an NBA factory. Um, they want to go to a place that if they're going to stay and take these classes, that it's going to net them something down the road, whether it's you know, after something post-basketball where they can start a business of some sort. I think the, the great part about being a part of Duke is that we have a coach that does not have to flash around, hey, I can get you to the NBA or, 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 or any of these things that, are, that he knows are, are pitches that players may want to hear. He's going to tell you what Duke is going to offer. Uh, and I think if what we're not only succeeding at is in, a, in addition to getting these one-and-done type players, I don't want to say one-and-done players because a lot of them end up staying more than one year, but these one-and-done type players um, – I, I think getting these elite players, they're looking for something more than basketball. They're looking for that network. They're looking for that family. They're looking for a place that they can unpack and just be a kid for a year or two um, and, and be a part of that college experience. And I think one thing that I really love is that every single player, whether they stay one year, they stay four years or five years in, in a couple, in like Emil Jefferson's example, they are staying and they are really a part of this campus. They, they say they, a lot of the times when they do leave, they say it's very hard to do so because of how much they love being at Duke. And these guys that are leaving from Kentucky are not saying the same thing. They're saying they are ready to go to the NBA, and that's what they've been trained to do. Uh, so, Coach Cal, uh, I don't know why you decided that you wanted to have all the salt in the world, but maybe you should stop uh, because it's not, it's not good for your health, I hear. Uh, maybe you should just kind of focus on Kentucky and, and what you guys are going to do this season. And we'll do things our way. Um, you know, our way is, is just as good and it's netted just as many national championships as you've had the last five years. So um, that, was my, that was my little mini rant. It's not as good a rant as, as Jason's was, but uh, a rant nonetheless. I'm really glad you brought it up. I'm really glad you mentioned that because, um, first of all, I, I love how jealous John Calipari has become of Duke. Um, and it's so patently obvious. And, I mean, Duke doesn't – we don't talk about – Kentucky, certainly Coach K, certainly Coach K doesn't talk about John Calipari at all, and Calipari cannot stop talking about Duke. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, you mentioned Donald to me the most important thing here, which is the difference. Um, the difference in the Duke and Kentucky programs, they're both recruiting one and done kind of kids, but at Kentucky, those kids are not part of the campus. They're not going to school. I'm not saying they're not going to class, although a lot of them don't go to class. I, what I'm saying is they aren't. They aren't getting a true student experience. They are they're living in their a, own dormitory. Yeah, their own yeah, and dormitory. It's, and it's, I was just going to say, they're, they're, for that reason. 
They're housed in a special basketball dorm that is ridiculous, in like the kind of a lap of luxury that you can't even imagine. Folks, go online and Google Kentucky basketball dorm, and you'll see the photos and the such, because Calipari's proud of this, and he shows it off. Um, at Duke, the basketball players are living with, with the other students. They're part of the Duke community. They go to classes with everyone else. Um, uh, you know, Coach K talked about unpacking your bags. They unpack their bags, and they're part of Duke, even if they're only there for one year. And that's what does not happen at Kentucky. And that's the difference in the two programs. And that's why I'm proud of what we have. And I'd be a little bit embarrassed if we ever became what Kentucky is. Um, no, it, it's a it, it's a good point to bring up, Donald. And uh, and I think that John Calipari might be not quite as salty if uh, if he hadn't got caught cheating and had Final Fours vacated at his two previous stops before he was at Kentucky. So maybe, I, I, maybe I think he brings, it, a, I, brings up some of it upon himself. I think one of the greatest things ever, like the greatest question that a, a media has ever asked any individual was uh, in 20, I think it was 2011, when he made it to the Final Four with Kentucky for the first time. And a media person, a media person asked, how does it feel to make your first Final Four? And Coach Cal was like, oh, I've made several. And he's like, no, I ask again, how does it feel that to make it to finally make it to your first one? And he was obviously insinuating about the other ones that he had in the past that had been vacated. Um, but it was, just so, it was just so ice cold, and Cal did not get it, and then later on realized what that, what that question meant and was visibly angry. But, uh, yeah, oh. that, that's, that's, what, that's Coach Cal for you. That's, uh, that, that, that's some clever stuff right there. I will, I will give my quick parting shot. Um, I, if we had recorded earlier in the day, it would have had a slightly different tone. But um, about an hour ago, the Duke field hockey, the women's uh, field hockey team, uh, lost in the NCAA tournament to Delaware. They were a number one seed, and they had a really successful season. They uh, lost in the ACC championship game to North Carolina. I had a few friends in college who were on the field hockey team, so I just wanted to give a shout-out to them. Uh, for what I guess was a great regular season. I, I, I can't admit that I, I follow the team very closely, but I have a lot of friends who are, who are pretty invested in it. So um, shout out to Duke Field Hockey for a really great season. Hopefully um, you can build on that next year and, and go a little farther in the tournament. So I think that's it for us for this week. It was a big, long episode, but um, hope I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. And we'll be, back, uh, we'll be back soon to talk about the next round of games that Duke is going to be playing. Obviously, um, they have a big football game coming up against Pittsburgh and the basketball game against Kansas. So um, not sure exactly when we'll get a new episode to you, but it will be soon. So with that, um, for Jason Evans and for Donald Wine, I am Sam Klein. This was the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Duke Band, take us home. <laughs>